Let's pray. Father, what a wonderful day this has been. We felt your presence, and we know that your presence will be with us today as we study this very important subject about the faith of Jesus. We ask, Father, that you will instruct us. Help us to understand the balance between the commandments of God and faith in Jesus. And we thank you, Father, for hearing our prayer, for we ask it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. I'd like to begin by reading Revelation chapter 14 and verse 12. This is the concluding verse of the third angel's message. And it says this, Here is the patience of the saints. We already studied the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God, which was the last subject that we studied, and the faith of Jesus. Now, I need to tell you that that final phrase of the third angel's message is translated differently in the diverse versions of the Bible. There are some versions that translate who have the faith of Jesus, and there are others who translate those who have faith in Jesus. In fact, if you looked at the number of uh, Bible versions that are available today, you would find that they're about equally divided as far as the correct translation is concerned. Faith of Jesus or faith in Jesus. I personally believe, as we study along, that the proper way of translating this phrase is faith in Jesus. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and have faith in Jesus. You see, we're going to find that there is a balance between keeping the commandments of God and having faith in Jesus Christ. Now, if you were uh, actually driving down a road and it was snowing very, very hard and the road was slippery and on both sides of the road you had very deep ditches, which of those two ditches would you rather fall into? Would it be the left ditch or would it be the right ditch? I'm sure you're thinking we wouldn't want to fall into either the left or the right ditch. Well, you know, it's not any better to fall in the right ditch or the left ditch or vice versa because in both cases, you're off the main road. And in the same way, we're going to notice in our study today that there are those who emphasize the commandments of God, but... They don't emphasize faith in Jesus. And there are those who emphasize faith in Jesus, but they want to discard the commandments of God. But Revelation chapter 14 and verse 12 has a perfect balance, a balance between faith and works, a perfect balance between law and grace. And by the way, I must say that the Greek construction of the expression, the faith of Jesus, or the faith in Jesus, is actually uh, in, uh, written in such a way that either translation is allowable. Grammatically, either translation is allowable. But once again, I believe that the correct translation is those who have faith in Jesus. You see, we're going to find that there are two dangers that Christians face. One danger is to emphasize faith to the exclusion of works. And the other danger is to uh, emphasize grace at the expense of law. Actually, both need to go together. And that's why the third angel's message mentions both. They keep the commandments of God and they have faith in Jesus. Now, there are two ditches that we need to be careful about. The first ditch, which we will call the right ditch, is what is called legalism. It's the idea that you can be saved by keeping the commandments of God, that you can be saved by your works. Now, we find several examples of this very dangerous ditch on the right-hand side of the road in Scripture. 
The first example that I would like us to notice is the story of a rich young ruler. This story is found in Matthew chapter 19. I'm not going to read the whole story. I'm going to tell you the first part of it. A rich young ruler comes to Jesus and says, what do I need to do to have eternal life? This young man wants eternal life. And I want you to notice what Jesus had to say to him. Matthew 19, beginning with verse 17. So he said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is, God. But if you want to enter life, keep the commandments. What kind of life was Jesus talking about when he said, if you want to enter life? Eternal life. Because the young man said that he wanted eternal life. So Jesus says, if you want eternal life, what do you need to do? You need to keep the commandments. Verse 18, he said to him, which ones? Jesus said, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and your mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. By the way, that one is not one of the last six. Instead of the one that says, thou shalt not covet, Jesus puts in, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, because loving your neighbor is the opposite of covetousness. It's the positive way of putting the commandment that says, thou shalt not covet. Now, when the young man he hears this, uh, he's pretty excited. Notice what we find in verse 20. The young man said to him, all these things I have kept from my youth. In other words, I am a commandment keeper. I'm ready to receive eternal life. But he says, what do I still lack? Jesus said to him, if you want to be perfect, that, by the way, means complete. If you want to be complete or perfect, go sell what you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Let me ask you, was this young man really keeping the commandments of God? No. He was externally keeping them. He was keeping them according to the letter, but his service was a service that did not come out of love. In other words, it did not have the motivation of faith. It did not have the motivation of love. Therefore, his commandment keeping was only external. Question, will external commandment keeping give you eternal life? The Bible says, no, this young man did not receive eternal life because he did not love his neighbor as himself. Externally, he kept the commandments of God, but those uh, commandments were not kept through a motivation of faith in the heart. Let's notice another story that illustrates the idea that you can be saved by your works. Notice the story of the Pharisee and the publican in Luke 18, verses 9 through 14. Luke 18, 9 through 14. Also, he spoke this parable to some who what? Trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Did these people feel like they were really law keepers? They most certainly did. They felt pretty righteous. Notice what it continues saying. Here Jesus is going to tell the story. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. Interesting, he didn't pray to God, he prayed with himself. God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. In other words, I thank you that I'm a commandment keeper and I don't break the commandments like these. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the tax collector, notice the contrast, standing afar off would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified, by the way, that means forgiven, went home justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Were these individuals really commandment keepers? No. 
Did they keep the commandments externally? Did they appear to have good works? Were they keeping the Sabbath? And were they tithing? And were they fasting and not eating certain things? Most certainly. But that was not true commandment keeping because it did not come from a changed heart. It did not come as a result of faith. So external keeping of the commandments will not do it unless the inward motivation of faith is there. We have another story, the story of the prodigal son. You remember the story of the prodigal son? We usually emphasize the son that left home and came back. But there was an older son in that story. You know, when his brother came back, uh, smelling like swine because he'd worked among the swine, uh, his father called a party and killed the fatted calf and called all the friends and relatives together to celebrate the return of the son. And the older son hears that his brother has come back and he's filled with anger. And notice what he says to his father in Luke 15, beginning with verse 29. So he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I have been serving you. I never transgressed your commandment at any time. Did he claim to be a law keeper? Why did he keep his father's law? Because he loved his father or because he wanted to earn the favor of his father? It's because he wanted to earn his father's favor. It was not an obedience to the commandments that came from the heart. And so he says, I never transgressed your commandment at any time, and yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with, with my friends. But as soon as this son of yours came, he doesn't even say my brother, he says, this son of yours came who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. Are you catching the spirit of what it means to claim to keep the commandments of God, but with the wrong motivation, not with faith, works without faith, trying to justify yourself by your works, without the motivation of faith and love from your heart. I want you to notice also another parable that Jesus told, the famous parable of the vineyard workers. It's found in Matthew chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20, uh, the Bible says that the owner of the vineyard went out uh, several times during the day. He went out at 6 in the morning, then he went back at 9, and then at noon, then he went at three in the afternoon, five in the afternoon to find workers because he needed all the time more workers for his vineyard. Finally, at six o'clock, pay time came. There were some individuals who had worked 12 hours. There were others who had worked nine. Some had worked six. Some had worked three. And some had only worked one. And when pay time came, the owner of the vineyard paid them all the same. And those who worked more, notice what they said in Matthew 20, verse 10. But when the first came, they supposed that they would receive what? More. So they worked in order to get what? In order to get more. Not because they wanted simply to work out of grace. They were working because they felt that if they worked, they deserved more. And so it says, and they likewise received each a denarius. And when they had received it, they complained against the landowner, saying, These last men have worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the heat of the day. But he answered one of them and said, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what is yours and go away. I wish to give to this last man the same as you. Is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with my own things, or is your eye evil because I am good? So you'll notice that working in God's vineyard does not earn more for some than for others. They're all paid salvation by God's grace, not by the work that they perform, not by what they earn. Now, it's interesting to notice the motivation that led the Pharisees to obey God and to keep His law. Notice Matthew chapter 6 and verses 1 and 2, and then we'll go to verse 5. Matthew 6, 1 and 2, and then verse 5. Here Jesus says, Take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before men 
with what motivation? To be what? To be seen by them. Why did the Pharisees do their works? To be what? To be seen by them. Otherwise, you have no reward from your Father in heaven. Verse 2, Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may what? Have glory from men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. Notice verse 5, And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets, that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. Why did the Pharisees perform their works? Why did they keep the law? Was it because they came from the, it came from their hearts? Because they loved God? Because they had faith in God? Absolutely not. They kept the commandments externally because they wanted to be seen by men and they wanted God to recognize them and save them because they were keeping the commandments of God. That is what is called legalism. So if you emphasize only the commandments of God to the exclusion of faith, you have what? You have legalism. And by the way, do you know that Jesus says that we're supposed to do good works to be seen by men? You say, now wait a minute. Didn't we just read that the Pharisees stood in public places and they blew the trumpet so that they could be seen, their works could be seen by men? Yes, but Jesus said that our works should be seen by men. But I want you to notice the difference. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 16. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may what? See your good works. That's the same as what the Pharisees, you know, they wanted to, their good works to be seen. But Jesus says that they may see your good works and what? and glorify your Father in heaven. There's the difference. You see, the Pharisees kept the law because they wanted to be seen by men, because they wanted to earn God's salvation by showing how good they were. Jesus says, you cannot be saved by keeping the commandments. You cannot be saved simply because you follow externally a list of rules. I want you to notice uh, Matthew chapter 23 and verses 25 to 28. We're still dealing with the first ditch, the right-hand ditch, the ditch that has to do with the idea that you can keep God's law, God will save you, and human beings will recognize your greatness because of all of the good things that you do. Matthew 23, verse 25. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. What's a hypocrite? It's someone who appears to be one thing when inside they are what? They're another. So he says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you cleanse the what? There it is, the outside of the cup and dish. But inside they are full of extortion and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee. First cleanse the inside of the cup and dish, that the outside of them may be clean also. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautifully, beautiful outwardly, but inside are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. Even so, you also outwardly appear righteous to men, but inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. So what was the problem of the Pharisees, the problem of the Jews? They claimed to keep God's law to keep God's commandments. But they did not have love. They did not have faith. They had the wrong motivation. They wanted glory for themselves. They wanted God to save them because of the good works that they were performing. But folks, there's another ditch. It's the left-hand ditch. It's called antinomianism. You say, what is antinomianism? It's the idea that you can be saved and you don't have to keep the commandments. In other words, one side of the ditch is where people say, I'm saved by my works and the motivation of faith is not there. On the other side, you have those who say, I'm saved by grace through faith 
and my works don't matter at all. Keeping the law is unnecessary because Jesus kept the law for me or because the law was nailed for, to the cross or because the law was meant for the Jews. Are you understanding the other side of the spectrum? And there are texts, primarily from the writings of the Apostle Paul, that antinomians love to use. For example, Galatians 2 and verse 16. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 16. Here the Apostle Paul says, knowing that a man is not justified, this is important, man is not justified by the works of the law, but by what? By faith in Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by what? And not by works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. So the Apostle Paul says, by the works of the law, no one will be what? No one will be justified. And so some Christians say, see, you don't need to have any works because the Apostle Paul says that you're not justified by works. But we need to read carefully what the Apostle Paul is saying. He's not saying that good works are not necessary. He's saying that we cannot be justified or saved by those good works. He's not talking about works that come as a result of salvation. He's talking about works that are performed with the intention of God saving us. In fact, another favorite text is Galatians 5 and verse 4, where the Apostle Paul says to the Galatians, You have become estranged from Christ. You who attempt to be what? To be justified by law, you have fallen from what? You have fallen from grace. So some people, uh, they say, see, the Apostle Paul says that we don't have to have good works. We don't have to keep the law. All we have to do is believe in Jesus. All we have to do is have faith and we're justified. No works necessary. But what they don't do is continue reading there in Galatians 5. You see, after the Apostle Paul says these words that I just read in Galatians 5, 4, you have become estranged from Christ, you who attempt to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. The Apostle Paul continues in the same chapter talking about the fruit of the Spirit. Those are not works that we perform for God to save us. Those are works that are performed once God has saved us. They are the fruit of salvation. They are the result of having faith in Jesus Christ. They don't save us, but they show that we're saved. In fact, notice Galatians 5, verses 16 to 26. The Apostle Paul says, I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. Now notice, but if you are led by the Spirit, you are not what? Under the law. Does the law condemn those who are guided by the Holy Spirit? Absolutely not. Now notice verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like. Does the Apostle Paul have a lot of bad things to say about all this list of sins? Those who commit these sins, are they led by the Holy Spirit? Is the Apostle Paul saying that those who have been saved should be led by the Spirit and they should no longer practice these things? In Galatians 5, the very same chapter, notice what he continues saying here, uh, at the end of this verse. He continues saying, verse 21, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will what? Will not inherit the kingdom of God. Does God expect a change in the life? Does He expect us to forsake these sins? In the same chapter where he says that if you think that you can be justified by law, you've fallen from grace, then he says, but if you've been justified by grace, you will produce in your life the fruit of the Spirit and you will not continue to practice these sins. 
Is he balanced in his view? He most certainly is. He believes in the commandments of God. He also believes in what? Faith in Jesus. Now notice what he continues saying in verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. Let me ask you, have you ever seen a law against peace? Anybody ever seen a law against love? Anybody ever seen a law against kindness? Or a law against self-control? Absolutely not. You see, those who live according to the Spirit, there is no law that condemns them. Those who practice the list of sins that we noticed here will not inherit eternal life because they do not have the fruit of the Spirit that flows from their conversion experience. Notice verse 24, and those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh, including all of the works that we read, have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Did the Apostle Paul believe in good works? Did he believe in keeping the law of God? Yes, but as the fruit of salvation, not as the cause of salvation. Now, there's some other texts that uh, people who are against the law use, people who say, oh, it's only grace, it's only faith, you don't have to worry about works, you don't have to worry about the law. Let's notice some of those verses, and then also notice the context that we find immediately after those declarations by Paul. Romans 3, verse 28. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law, so man is what? Justified by what? By faith, apart from the deeds of the law. So some Christians conclude, they say, see, we don't need the law anymore because it says that we're justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. Unfortunately, they don't read just three verses farther down. Notice verse 31. Do we then make void the law through faith? Certainly not. On the contrary, we establish the law. Let me ask, sir, is there room for faith and the law? According to Paul, yes. He says, we don't do away with the law by faith. We establish the law. Even though we're not justified by the law, we establish the law by faith. Another favorite passage by those who say that you don't have to keep the law, you don't need works, Romans 5, verse 20. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. So some people say, see, where there's lots of sin, there's lots of grace. So let's sin a lot so that there's lots of grace. Unfortunately, they don't read Romans 6, verses 1 and 2, right below that. The Apostle Paul knew that they were going to use this verse in this way. And so he says in verse 1 of chapter 6, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Did he know somebody was going to misuse that statement that where grace abounded, where sin abounded, grace would much more abound? He sure knew that that was going to be misused. So he says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Is that clear? Another favorite text, and this is the all-time favorite, is Romans 6 and verse 14. It says there, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. And so people say, See, you Adventists, you're under the law because you think you have to keep the commandments, but we are under grace. Unfortunately, they don't read the next verse. Notice what the Apostle Paul says. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? Certainly not. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? Let me ask you, being under grace, does that excuse us trampling upon God's holy law? Does that excuse us from sin? 
Of course it doesn't, according to the Apostle Paul himself. So when Paul gives a controversial statement, immediately he balances it off. And he says, listen, just because you're under grace doesn't mean that you can trample upon the law. Just because where sin abounded, grace abounds all the more doesn't mean that you can disobey God's law. Just because you're justified by faith without works of law doesn't mean that you get rid of the law. You establish the law is what the Apostle Paul has to say. You see, the Apostle Paul knew that there were going to be some people who would have a, a disdain for the law of God. They would profess godliness, but they would not be concerned about their life which means that they really don't have faith. They really don't have the inward motivation of love. Notice Titus chapter 1 and verse 16. Titus 1 and verse 16. Here it's speaking about a certain group of individuals who claim to be Christians. They profess to know God. So are these Christians? Yeah, they profess to know God. But in works, they what? They deny him. In their what they, they deny him? They profess one thing, but in their works, they deny him. Being what? Abominable, disobedient, and disqualified for every good what? For every good work. Is the Apostle Paul balanced here? Is he saying that if you profess Jesus, your works should demonstrate it? Absolutely. Notice 1 John 2, 3, and 4. We read this in our last study together. 1 John 2. Verses 3 and 4. Now by this we know that we know him. If we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Is this the correct balance? It most certainly is. See, there's a group of people who say, I know him, and I don't have to keep the commandments. There are others who say, I keep the commandments, but they don't know him. The key is to know him and keep his commandments, to have faith and trust in him and to keep his commandments. Notice also, Jesus spoke about people who claimed to be Christians, but whose works showed that they trampled upon the law of God. Matthew 7, verse 21. Matthew 7, verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, are those Christians if they say, Lord, Lord? Absolutely. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And what is Jesus going to say? Oh, yeah, you were mine because you said you were mine. No. Notice verse 23. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice what? Lawlessness. What was their problem? They claimed to follow Jesus, but what did they do with the law? They trampled on the law of God. And so you have these two ditches. You have the ditch of those who say that they can be saved by keeping the law, and you have the ditch of those who say that they can be saved by faith without any works or without obeying God's holy law. What do we need to do to stay on the road? The fact is that there is a perfect balance between faith and works, grace and the law. Let's notice several of those verses. Go with me to John 15 and verse 8. Here Jesus says, By this my Father is glorified, that you bear what? Much fruit, that's the fruit of the Spirit, so you will be my disciples. How is it that we show that we're Christ's disciples? By bearing what? Much fruit, not the works of the flesh, but fruit. Now, a favorite passage of those who believe that the law was nailed to the cross and Christians don't have to keep the law, you know, and works aren't really that important, is Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Notice what it says. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. Does the Apostle Paul say clearly that we cannot be saved by our works in these verses? He absolutely makes it clear. We cannot be saved by our works. 
he explicitly says that it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. The only problem is people don't read verse 10. Does God expect good works from those who have been created new in Jesus Christ? Absolutely. Notice verse 10. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus. See, we're in Christ Jesus when we receive Him as, as our Savior and we're baptized. And so it says, For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for what? For good works, which God prepared. See, God is the one who does the works in us which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Now, the passage that I especially want to dwell on for quite an extensive period of time is the passage that we find in James chapter 2. See, people love to quote the Apostle, the Apostle Paul, but when it comes to James, they kind of want to shuffle that one under the rug. Now, let's notice James chapter 2 and verses 14 to 24. Here you will find the balance between faith in Jesus and keeping the commandments. You see, the end time generation, folks, is not going to legalistically keep the commandments. They're not going to keep the Sabbath legalistically like the Jews did. No, they're going to keep the Sabbath because they have a loving relationship with Jesus, because they have faith in Jesus. They're going to keep the commandments of God and also have faith in Jesus in perfect balance. Notice James 2, verse 14. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith? Notice that they don't really have faith. If someone says he has faith, but does not have what? Works. Is it possible to say that you have faith and not have works? Absolutely. He's saying that there are some people that were that way. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith, but does not have works? Can faith save him? Actually, in the Greek, it says, can this kind of faith save him? A faith that is workless. Can that kind of faith save him? Verse 15, if a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to him, depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also faith by itself, in other words, faith alone, and by the way, this is the reason why Martin Luther uh, did not like the, the epistle of James. In fact, he called James the epistle of straw. And if he'd had his way, he would have cut the epistle of James out of the Bible. Because Luther was fighting against the Roman Catholic Church that taught that works, works, pilgrimages, you know, work your way to heaven. And so Martin Luther fought against that with everything he had, just like Paul had fought against the Jews. So he didn't understand how James could say that faith without works is dead. And so he says, thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is what? Dead. You see, faith and works are a package deal. You can't have one without the other. You have to have both together. So he says, faith, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, and I have works. And he says, show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. How do we show our faith? We show our faith by our works. Let me ask you, can we claim to have faith in Jesus and live like the devil? We can claim, claim it. And we can claim to be saved and watch what the world watches and dress the way the world dresses and be entertained the way the world is entertained and do what the world does. And we can say, I have faith. I'm a Christian. But if your life doesn't change, if there are no works, if you do not keep God's commandments out of love for him, it's a sham. It's not a true relationship. And so he says, show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. And then he says, you believe, and by the way, that word believe is the same word for faith that is used throughout this passage. You believe that there is one God. You do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. So if you, if you just believe that there's one God, you know, people say, well, we all believe in the same God, don't we? But it's a superficial belief. It's a belief up here that God exists. That's not going to save you. Do you think the devil believes that God exists? He not only believes it, he knows it. 
And so James is saying, you believe that there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. But do you want to know, O oh foolish man, that faith without works is dead? And then he's going to use Abraham. See, this is what threw Martin Luther for a loop, because Martin Luther said, fide, sola fide, faith alone, without works. And what does James say? But do you want to know, foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Was not our Abraham, our father, justified by works? When he offered Isaac, his son, on the altar, really, what is he saying? Abraham was justified by a faith that works. He's not saying that he was justified by works. He's already said that you need faith and works together. So he's saying, don't you know that our father Abraham was justified by a faith that works? That's what he means. And so he continues saying, was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Did it take a lot of faith for Abraham to be willing to offer his son on the altar? How did Abraham show that he believed God when God said, go offer your son and I'll spare him? How, how did he show that he believed really God? By what he did. His works proved that his faith was true. And then it says in verse 22, do you see that faith was what? Working together. See, it's a package deal, a faith that works. And so it says, do you see that faith was working together with his works? And by works, faith was made what? Perfect or complete. So in order to have a complete saving relationship, what do you need? A faith that what? That works. Verse 23, and the scripture was fulfilled which says, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. You see, then, that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. When he says by faith only, he's talking about faith is the only thing you have, and you don't have works. You cannot be justified by a faith that's alone. Because the true faith that justifies is a faith that has works with it. Are you understanding what I'm saying? He's not saying that you're saved by works, like the Jews believed, by keeping the law. He's saying that if you have faith, you will keep the law. If you have faith, you will produce works. In other words, works are the fruit of salvation. And so he says in verse 25, Likewise, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works? By the way, according to the context, by a faith that works, justified by works, when she received the messengers and sent them out another way. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Let me ask you, what's more important, the body or the breath? What's more, what's more important? A bodiless spirit or a spiritless body? They both have to go what? Together in, for, in order for you to have a living person. In the same way, faith and works have to go together in order to have a genuine living relationship with God. You see, James and Paul are fighting against two different enemies. The apostle Paul is facing the enemy who says, I'm saved by my works. Paul says, no way, you're saved by faith. And those that James is fighting against, they're saying, we don't need to perform works. And James is saying, wait a minute, if you had real faith, you would produce works. In other words, James and Paul are not fighting each other. They're fighting two different enemies of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul is saying how you, sa how you are saved, and James is telling you how a saved person lives. In other words, Paul is talking about the root of our salvation. James is talking about the fruit of our salvation. So those in Paul's day needed to hear about grace. Those in the days of James needed to hear about the law because of the error that they were teaching at that time. You see, works for Paul and James are defined differently. See, for Paul, works of law are evil works. See, the expression works of law isn't talking about good works at all. Those are evil works. Because works of law, by definition, are works that somebody performs in order to manipulate God into saving them. Whereas works for James 
are good works because they flow from a saving faith relationship with Jesus. So in other words, works for Paul and James are defined differently. Works for Paul are evil because those are actions that are performed in order to earn salvation. For James, works are different. Works are genuine fruits of faith that come from my relationship with Jesus Christ. By the way, do you know that the Apostle Paul also said that we need a faith that works? See, don't think that James is contradicting Paul. Notice Galatians chapter 5 and verse 6. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 6. It says there, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but what? Faith working through love. So does the Apostle Paul say that faith needs to work? Yes, it needs to work through what? It needs to work through love. In other words, faith and works are like two sides of a coin. Which side of the coin is more important? Uh, faith and works are like two oars of a rowboat. Let me ask you, which oar is more important, the right oar or the left oar? If you, if you use the right oar, which is the oar of works, you know, you're going to go in circles to the left. Is you, if you use the left oar, which is claiming to have faith, but you don't have any works, you're going to go to the right. In order to have a balanced, progressive Christian experience, you have to have both oars working together. Now listen up. Works are the visible manifestation of faith. Did you catch that? Works are the visible manifestation of faith. And faith is the inward motivation for works. In other words, we're not saved by faith alone. We're not saved by works alone. We're not saved by a combination of faith plus works. We are saved by a faith that works. And a faith that works is the only true, genuine kind of faith. He who says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Now, I'd like to read several passages before we draw this to a close that show the balance between grace and commandment keeping. Faith in Jesus and keeping the commandments of God. Titus chapter 2 and verses 11 through 15. Listen to this. For the grace of God, the what? The grace of God that brings salvation. What does the grace of God bring? Salvation has appeared to all men. So some people say, oh, the wonderful grace of God has nothing to do with the law or with works. Hold on. The grace of God teaches us something. It says, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us. Grace teaches us something that we should do what? Denying ungodliness and worldly lusts. We should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. Does grace have anything to teach us about the way we behave? Most certainly. Looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. Now notice this. This is Paul, by the way, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for what? Zealous for good works. Why did Jesus redeem us? So that we would be what? Zealous for good works. Did the Apostle Paul have a very high concept of good works and fruit of the Spirit? He most certainly did. He wasn't that individual that Christians claimed that he was, that it's all about faith, it's all about grace, your lifestyle doesn't matter. The law doesn't matter. You don't have to keep the commandments. They were for the Jews. They were nailed to the cross and so on. The Apostle Paul is balanced in his theology. Notice Titus 3, verses 5 through 8. Titus 3, 5 through 8. But when the kindness and the love of God, our Savior, toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, see, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he what? He saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. And now notice the fruit. He said very clearly, 
that it's not by works of righteousness that we've done. He saved us by His mercy. But then notice what He says in verse 7, that having been justified by His grace, in other words, once we've been saved, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This is a faithful saying, and these things I want you to affirm constantly, that those who have believed, the word believed is the same word for faith, those who have, fed, have faith in God should be careful to what? Should be careful to maintain good works. So what happens when you're saved? You will maintain what? Good works. By the way, it's interesting to notice that for each of the seven churches in Revelation chapter 2 and 3, Jesus doesn't say most of the time, he says it once or twice, he doesn't say, I know your faith. What does he say? I know your what? I know your works. Now I want to read you an interesting statement uh, that we find in the book Selected Messages, volume 1, page 373. Listen to this. It is essential to have faith in Jesus and to believe you are saved through him. But there is danger in taking the position that many do, that many do take in saying, I am saved. Many have said, you must do good works and you will live. But apart from Christ, no one can do good works. Many at the present day say, believe only and live. But then she says, faith and works go together, believing and doing are blended. Now I want to read you a statement that's found in the same book, volume 3, page 172. It's speaking specifically about this expression, the faith of Jesus, and you're going to notice that the author says that the best way to translate this is faith in Jesus. She explains what it means. Notice what she says. The third angel's message is the proclamation of the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus Christ. The commandments of God have been proclaimed. She's speaking about Seventh-day Adventists. But the faith of Jesus Christ has not been proclaimed by Seventh-day Adventists as of what? Equal importance. The law and the gospel going what? Hand in hand. The gospel is that Jesus saves us apart from works that we perform but then, on the other hand, you have the law, which is keeping his commandments as a result of salvation. She continues saying, I cannot find language to express this subject in its fullness, the faith of Jesus. It is talked of, but not understood. What constitutes the faith of Jesus that belongs to the third angel's message, she asks? Jesus becoming our sin bearer that he might become our sin-pardoning Savior. Notice what the expression means. It means what? It means Jesus becoming our sin-bearer, that he might become our sin-pardoning Savior. He was treated as we deserve to be treated. He came to our world and took our sins, that we might take his righteousness. And faith in the ability of Christ to save us amply and fully and entirely is the faith of Jesus. Are you understanding why these two expressions appear side by side? They keep the commandments of God and have faith in Jesus. It's because both of these things are necessary to have a balanced Christian life. The only way that you can keep the commandments of God is by having faith in Jesus. It's neither one or the other isolated but both of them together. Now, some people wonder about the two covenants. They say, well, you know, wasn't the old covenant a covenant of law and the new covenant is a covenant of grace? Of course not. Let me explain it very briefly as we draw this to a close. You remember that uh, the Bible says that Moses went up to the top of Mount Sinai and God said, I want to make a covenant with Israel. And I want you to go down and give them a message. Tell them I want them to be my special people whether they're willing to obey my voice and keep my covenant. Moses says, okay, I'll go down. So Moses goes down and says, God has sent a message with me. He wants to know if you want to form a covenant relationship with him, if you want to be a special people. What do you think? They say, oh, all that the Lord has said, we will do. They didn't know what they were saying. That was a legalistic answer. 
because their hearts were not transformed. Their hearts were not changed. How long did their promise last? A few days at the most, because a few days later they were worshiping the golden calf because their heart had not been changed. Much later, for that reason, God spoke about a new covenant. Notice Jeremiah 31, verses 31 to 34. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. See, I gave them this covenant and they broke my covenant. He says, I'm not going to make a covenant like that anymore. By the way, the reason why that covenant had problems was because Israel did not have it written on their hearts. They just looked at the covenant as being rules and regulations on tables of stone. God wanted to write it on their hearts. In fact, notice verse 33. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. So what was the problem with the first covenant? Did the first covenant have law? Yes or no? Yes. Does the second covenant, does the new covenant have the same law? Yes. The law doesn't change in the two covenants. What changes is the place where the law is written. You see, in the old covenant, it was just on tables of stone. Israel said, we'll do it. They couldn't because they didn't have faith. They didn't have love for God. Their heart hadn't been changed. But God says, I'm going to take that same law and I'm going to write it in your heart. I'm going to write it in your mind, and that way you will obey me, not because you have to in order to be saved, in order to show men how good you are, but you will keep my law because it comes from your heart because you love me. This is what Jesus meant when he said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And so God wants us to keep the commandments and also to have the faith of Jesus. Let's pray.